Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome dear friends, in the previous module we had looked at Belsimo's arguments on gendered construction of the female body through cosmetic enhancement and visualization technologies. Today we will discuss her thoughts about the virtual body in cyberspace where body is represented as a machine interface. This segment by Belsimo is rather an exploration. It functions as a questionnaire for VR technologies, scholars, researchers, academicians and creators. Belsimo wants to establish the meaning of certain terms, virtual reality, cyberspace and electronic frontier before discussing the concept of virtual body in the cyberspace and its gendering. With the development of VR technologies and its applications, the body has changed and has been redefined within the machine interface. Belsimo wants to suggest that the body is repressed and divorced from the locus of knowledge in the cyberspace. And in this context, locus may be understood as a rhetorical topos, a method of constructing an argument, a point of merger for various cultural arguments. In the next slide, we have a video which further clarifies this concept. This is an excerpt from the video titled The Future of Virtual Reality by Pil Kofold, a well-known VR expert. He takes us through the meaning of virtual reality and augmented reality. So I just wanted to talk a little bit, what exactly is virtual reality? So technically it means any computer, artificially computer generated world that can be experienced and interacted with. Uh, technically, any video game ever has been virtual reality, even if you're just playing it on a screen or your phone or what have you. It can be outer space, it can be a maze you're running through, it can be just about anything. What it has actually come to refer to are any experiences where the user uses special equipment to completely immerse themselves in that world. And the complete immersion is the important part. Most of these experiences are designed to completely block out whatever's going on around you. So augmented reality is different in that you're actually experiencing the real world still. You're still seeing what you're seeing. We just put a layer over it. I could be looking at you and see zombies or throw spiders on you or I don't know why I'm being so cruel, but that's the sort of thing that you could actually do. So virtual reality deals uh, with the head-mounted display. This is the visor or visors that actually go over your face. There are others, but these are the big three right now. Uh, the Vive, the Morpheus, and the Oculus Rift. And what actually is going on inside of those, each eye sees a different image, a uh, stereoscopic image, and as your head moves, it tracks where you're moving and changes the image appropriately. It can be a little scary at first, like all new technology can be, maybe seem a little bit dystopian, like you're completely cut off from the real world, maybe corporate control, I don't know. but. And if you've ever actually seen anybody in it, it's a little bit strange. It can almost be looking like somebody with an affliction. <laughs> if you've ever been walking down the street and been walking next to somebody talking on a Bluetooth headset, you don't necessarily know if they're actually talking on the phone or if they just blew a fuse. <laughs> and virtual reality is not entirely different, but what, <laughs> what is actually going on inside is a little bit of a different story. So you could actually be defending your castle with a bow and arrow from a bunch of uh, enemies. You could be, da, da, da. you could actually be painting in 3D space with an entirely new medium, where instead of a canvas, you can actually paint, walk around, see what you're doing. Or you could be training to become a wizard. <laughs> so anybody here ever want to go to Hogwarts? Because you are totally going to be able to go to Hogwarts. 
The simplistic understanding of the term we are is complicated by Belsimo as she deconstructs the virtual body in the virtual reality. According to Belsimo, the body in cyberspace and various virtual interfaces are reduced to codes, commodity and signifiers resulting in a biopolitics of the virtual body. Belsimo attempts to explore the intricacies of the biopolitics of the virtual body in the cyberspace as a subculture. As Veronika Hollinger has commented, Belsimo sets out to examine some of the features of technoculture which work to keep gender divisions in place to maintain the gendered status quo in spite of advances through which bodies are routinely tailored and retailored in almost every other respect. In the development of VR applications, the deconstruction of the natural body is now a completely naturalized phenomenon. Belsamo posits that the material body of the user is not an adequate representation of the disembodied cyberspace traveler. Rather, in the VR application, the user's body acts as a commodity in the application. It also articulates relationship among technologies, bodies and the narrative that is formulated within the cybersphere. Belsimo concludes that cultural intersections with VR produce gendered experiences and that studying the development of VR technologies allows us to investigate how myths about identity, nature and the body are re-articulated with new technologies. The manner of this re-articulation ensures the continuation and strengthening of traditional gendered narratives with the help of emerging technologies. Belsimo posits that the body is re-articulated with new technologies in ways that ensure that the traditional and occasionally revisionist narratives about the gendered and also the race marked body are socially, technologically reproduced. In this context, she explores the narrative of the body on the electronic frontier. In one sense, the frontier is an imaginary construction that identifies a horizon of contemporary cultural thought. In another, it is a real space on the fringe of mainstream culture. The electronic frontier names the space of information exchange, which is pre-existent in the flow of databases, fiber optic networks, computer memory, etc. The metaphor of frontier suggests the possibility of a vast, unexplored territory. We are surrounded by such electronic frontiers. We operate within and across such applications, gadgets and technologies. Our virtual reality and experiences are translated through various technologies in the form of smartphones, smartwatches, simulation, etc. For Belsimo, the virtual reality is the most fascinating area of discussion and analysis. She suggests that the virtual environments now more widely known as virtual reality are the most publicized computer applications of the last decade. Since 1987, virtual reality has further evolved into an industry in itself. It is also at the heart of an emergent subculture that includes computer generated realities, science fiction, fictional sciences and powerfully evocative new visualization technologies. Belsimo explores how the repression of the body is accomplished so easily. She also cautions us about the consequences of this disembodiment. The role of the body in the formation is a primary concern for feminist scholarship. Belsimo offers a reading of the cultural aspects of the virtual reality industry, which include its embodiment in a cyberpunk subculture, its media spectacles and commodities on offer. 
Her major concern is to discuss how the body is sold in the cyber space in the context of the biopolitics of VR. VR technologies produce a certain set of cultural narratives that reproduce dominant relations of power. As the use of such technologies is determined by broader social and cultural forces. We can see that since 1980s, cyberspace has emerged as a subculture, a cultural phenomenon dictated by technology. Belsimo looks at the marketing of the body in the cyberspace, suggesting that the realities created therein embody the desires of those who program them. And I quote from Jack Zipes, the inevitable outcome of most mass mediated fairy tales is a happy reconfirmation of the system which produces them. Belsimo also suggests the same for a technologically dominated society. Belsimo also presents a genealogy of the term cyberspace. The term cyberspace has gained acceptance among OVR technicians to name the interior space of VR programs. It was first used by William Gibson in his cyberpunk novel Neuromancer. The novel has been termed as the archetypal cyberpunk by Lawrence Person. Gibson's novel Neuromancer had legitimized cyberpunk as a mainstream branch of science fiction literature. Gibson is widely credited with introducing cyberspace to a mass audience and is spawning a new subgenre of science fiction called cyberpunk. However, some scholars claim that it was Werner Winge who was the first to introduce the notion of an alternative electronically mediated other plane in his novella True Names published in 1981. Much of the plot of this novella True Names involves interactions between people's virtual selves in cyberspace. Learning a fellow hacker's real world name or their true name could allow one to turn them into the government or to blackmail them, conveying a kind of power that could be considered analogous to the equivalent concept of myth and legend. Belsimo also discusses the cyberpunk which is an entanglement of technology and art. She takes up the example of Mundo 2000 in this context. Mundo 2000 was a preeminent hacker magazine of the 1990s, which offered a glimpse into the cyber culture around the fictional world of cyberspace. It stood out because of its glossy, virtually dense techno art layout with interviews from various cyberpunk visionaries. This magazine, we can say, picks up where Mick Luhan's mechanical bride left off without the rhetorical questions and for the most part without the cultural criticism. Whereas Mick Luhan had looked at magazine advertisements that hinted at the ominous fusion of six in technology, Mundo 2000 became the magazine to celebrate the fusion of six in technology in its advertisements for cyberpunk culture. Mundo 2000 also oddly evoked the countercultural rhetorics of the 1960s, retro topics such as drug synthesis instructions, mod fashion icons and reports from the underground etc. were incorporated. The high tech commodities reprogram culture by providing discursive space for new literary cultures and subcultures. Juxtaposition of countercultural rhetoric with technological elitism constructed an interesting stage for the promotion of VR technologies. It led to the development of a host of new produces, including biotechnical apparatuses such as data gloves, wired body suits, head mounted tracking devices, etc. In short, cyberspace gave a space to new subcultures. It included popular cultural artifacts, for example, Mundo 2000, and films such as Lawn Mover Man and Johnny Mnemonic. 
also a specialized language that draws on the science of computer technology and computer programming as well as the promise of new high tech commodities. It promotes the sexiness of new technology and is also unabashedly elitist, representing cyberpunk bodies in glossy format. Apart from cultural transformation, the cyberspace also requires physical transformation in the form of VR gadgets in order to change the reality into a virtual reality. In contemporary science fiction, the 3D computer generated space or virtual environment is referred to as cyberspace, matrix or the net. In cyberpunk novels, real geographic urban suburban space is referred to as the sprawl. Graphic programs use virtual technologies to create a three-dimensional space for user interactions. Standard cyberspace hardware includes a set of wired goggles that track head movement connected to a computer that runs the VR software. In 1985, Jerome Lanier, an American computer scientist and visual artist, founded a company called VPL. The company prides itself on being a pioneer in virtual reality and visual programming. Lanier has become a cult figure in the VR subculture. It includes technological innovators, popular culture icons, game designers and computer entrepreneurs. Lanier is often quoted as saying that whatever the physical world has, virtual reality has as well. According to Belsemo, such juxtapositions of technology and the counterculture of reality effects suggest that cyberpunk subculture is actively engaged in the work of processing and promoting gendered and cultural meanings. However, Belsemo refrains from promoting technological determinism. Technological determinism argues that technologies necessarily and unilaterally expand the hegemonic control by a techno elite. Belsemo cautions us and wants us to avoid this trap as technologies have limited agency. They are also often linked with the commodity structures. Virtual reality industry actually disseminates a certain mythology and a set of metaphors and concepts that often reproduce the anxieties and preoccupations of contemporary culture. Simulated experiences offer opportunities for safe activity in a risky world. One of the most often repeated claims about VR is that it provides the technological means to construct personal realities which are free from the determination of body-based real identities. Belsimo suggests that virtual reality and virtual reality applications allow us to have a body-free universe where body is a functionality of the algorithm. We are emerged in the 1980s, a decade when the body is understood to be increasingly vulnerable, literally as well as discursively, to infection as well as to gender, race, ethnicity and ability critiques. Called the electronic LSD or an electronic out-of-body experience, VR in its celebrated media form seems little more than an escape from conventional reality, a way out for those who confront severe limitations reality imposes in the form of determining social structures and the physical body itself. With virtual reality, we are offered the vision of a body-free universe. Upon analyzing the lived experience of virtual reality, Belsimo discovers that this conceptual denial of the body is accomplished through the material repression of the physical body. Whereas VR promoters have focused primarily on the subjective and expressive dimension of VR in public relation campaigns for VR games, users are also told that the physical body 
is of no consequence in virtual worlds. The phenomenological experience of cyberspace depends on the willful repression of the material body. In saying this, Belsamo implicitly argues that we need to extend the ideological critique of virtual reality technologies. However, the VR does not completely negate the gendered experiences of the bodies in question. The virtual repression showcases the biases of the creator on many fronts. It also presents a critique of gendering. VR perhaps does not transform body-based subjectivities. The body may disappear representationally in the virtual world. The subjugation of the material body belies the gender bias in the theoretically gender-free domain of virtual reality. From a feminist perspective and also from the perspective of a gender critic, the repression of the material body belies a gender bias in the supposedly disembodied and gender-free world of the VR. Ironically, VR technologies articulate cultural narratives about the techno body so that these technologies have the effect of naturalizing a gendered body phenomenon. Indeed, we may go to great lengths to repress it and erase its referential traces. It does not disappear materially in the interface with the VR apparatus or in the phenomenological frame of the user, in the structures of their experiences coloring and impacting the virtual representations. Representation of the female body in video games can also be taken as an example. This technological gaze is a sub-product of the user's identity and the creator's own politics. VR applications visualize technologies. They no longer simply mimic or represent reality. Rather, they virtually recreate the reality. They are both cultural as well as technological constructions, fully saturated by the media and other forms of daily, everyday technologies. The critical framework once informed by feminist epistemology attempts to assess and understand the biopolitics of virtual body in cyberspace to figure out how the VR technologies socially and culturally mark bodies. Belsimo discusses the phenomenological dimensions of the technologically mediated body and ascertain the extent to which disembodied technological gaze is marked by the cultural imprints of gender. Belsimo's arguments around VR technologies are constructed on her findings against such inquiries. In contrast to a 2D database, VR applications allow users to interact with three-dimensional representations of information. With VR, different types of models in effect come alive. One can virtually enter them. VR encounters provide thus an illusion of control over reality or nature, especially over the unruly, gender and race marked material body. A rather simplistic understanding is given by Rendell Walser. Whereas film depicts a reality to an audience, cyberspace grants a virtual body and a role to everyone in the audience. According to Belsimo, the VR provides an abstract world, whereas world making is a continuous phenomenon. The perspective keeps on shifting from the user to the audience and to the creator of VR application. Jerome Lanier had said that whatever the physical world has, virtual reality has as well. So the question which emerges is, what exactly the virtual reality offers to us. The cyber spatial matrix serves as an abstract environment. However, all VR systems involve the interface of the body and technology in the use of some kind of bio apparatus. Belsamo also noticed the ease with which one makes sense of the scene projected on small lenses mounted 
in the front of the helmet. In most VR programs, our user experiences VR through our disembodied gaze, our floating moving perspective that mimes the movement of a disembodied camera eye. This is a familiar aspect of what may be called a filmic phenomenology, where the camera simulates the movement of perspective that rarely includes a self-referential visual inspection of the body as the vehicle of that perspective. Belsimo claims that much of VR application is restricted to the fellow-centric domain. This argument will be further taken on in detail in week 11, especially in the fifth module, where we will take up the biopolitics of gendered body in video games. What interests Belsimo is the way the repression of the body is technologically naturalized. A virtual body is enacted without any pain or cost of physical restructuring. A VR guarantees a body we desire without saying anything about the body that we already have with all its meanings and connotations. Body reconstruction programs, cosmetic surgery or bodybuilding display traditional gender and race markers of beauty, strength and sexuality. But a reconstructed body does not guarantee a reconstructed cultural identity. Body as a sense apparatus is nothing more than access baggage for the cyberspace traveler. Surprisingly, it does not eradicate body-based differentiation and domination. Much of the cyber reality is stuck in a masculinistic frame. Relations between cybernetically connected bodies often recreate traditional gender identities and or sexual identities. Sexualization of the female body is a common theme in various cyberpunk narratives. As creators are more comfortable with old body-based identities in terms of gender, they are more likely to reproduce the same. We can take the example of Molly and Case, the familiar characters in Gibson's Neuromancer trilogy or the Sprawl trilogy with biotechnological and cybernetic modifications. Rich in information, the experience of cyberspace is always conjectural, an effect of intersecting practices, economic, technological, bodily, political and cultural. The virtual body is the very medium of cultural expression itself, manipulated, digitalized and technologically constructed in virtual environments. Though cyberspace seems to represent a territory free from the burdens of history, it still is a site for the technological and no less conventional inscription of the gendered body. The issues we need to investigate with respect to the VR technologies is to produce simultaneous effects that are not easily judged to be either good or bad or moral or immoral within and across the body discourse. Even as VR technology promises a new form of intersubjectivity, it contributes to an unknown epidemic of cultural autism. Intimacy, for example, is now redefined as a quality of interaction between the human body and the machine. Even as new technologies promise new landscapes for scientific research, the possibility that they might still reinforce conventional and restrictive gendered norms cannot be negated. We have looked at new and emergent imaging technologies. The fact that such imaging technologies produce better images of human anatomy does not guarantee that doctors are using these images to produce either better diagnosis or better treatment programs for their patients. By analogy, the fact that virtual realities offer new information environments does not guarantee that people will use this information in better ways. It is just as likely that these new technologies will be used primarily to tell old stories 
stories that reproduce in high tech guise traditional narratives about the gendered and sexualized body in the appearance of techno body or the cyborg body. Belsebo suggests that virtual realities offer new information environment. It is for this matter the techno critics and cultural critics should advocate technology as means of cultural production and not technology as means of gendered production. The next module will build this argument further. In it we will discuss Belsemo's take on feminist cultural studies of science and technology and the gendered production of technobody. Thank you.